be handling his part of the presentation um, that describes the process that San Bernardino County went through to develop their vision. Um, so let's jump in here and talk about the framework. So um, as you, some of you may know, we introduced this framework at our annual conference in May. Uh, we also have a book coming out that um, discusses the uh, framework in great detail. That's coming out later this summer, so be out on the lookout for that. Um, but why we did this. So GFOA knows that maintaining a good financial condition over the long term is a big concern for its members. In fact, in our latest member survey, issues related to insufficient or unstable revenue and unsustainable cost structures accounted for seven of the top 10 issues that local governments were most concerned with. So with this in mind, GFOA worked on developing a new way to think about the financial well-being of local government. Um, our approach is based on a Nobel Prize winning body of research as well as many case studies with local governments of many different sizes and types. One of the key principles of the framework is that a local government's finances are a resource that is shared by the entire community. And because everybody has a claim on this resource, everybody also has to contribute to the resources upkeep. The finance office acting alone can't maintain a solid financial position for the local government over the long term. So why are we introducing this framework and encouraging um, folks to adopt it? There's a few reasons. One is that it makes finance everyone's business. Again, going back to uh, what I said earlier is that everyone has to be involved in maintaining the resource. It goes beyond numbers and provides strategies that you can use to lead your organization down the path toward a stronger financial foundation. Um, it's based on accurate models of behavior that are backed up by academic research. And finally, it works. Um, and again, we have lots of case studies to demonstrate that. We'll talk about a few of those today. Um, and then, of course, the book um, highlights even more case studies. So moving along. Um, the framework is comp comprised of five pillars. We're going to talk about those in, in a second. And again, today we're really focusing on that first pillar. But each of the pillars includes leadership strategies and what we call institutional design principles. So I'm going to describe those briefly. So a leadership strategy is just that. And, you know, because as, as a local leader, you can't order people to do certain things or to behave in a certain way. Um, we have to inspire people to do that. So how do you inspire this? You, we, we, um, inspire pride, loyalty, enthusiasm, so people will want to make the organization financially sustainable. And again, we have, we highlight uh, six different leadership strategies throughout the framework that will, can, again, give the tools to help you do that. And then the institutional design principles, we have eight institutional design principles. Those are sort of the rules of the game for how local government and other organizations work together. Um, they provide a context for the leadership strategies and are just really things um, that you want to keep in mind when you're designing um, uh, organizational structures. So here is our framework. Um, again, it is built on these five pillars. So the first pillar, again, is establishing a long-term vision. So we want to give people a reason to cooperate. We're going to talk about that in greater detail today. The second pillar is building trust in open communication. The third pillar is using collective decision making. The fourth pillar is create clear rules. And then that fifth pillar is treating everyone fairly. So you can really see how um, these things all come together and are very much related. Um, but again, today what we really want to focus on is this pillar number one, establish a long-term vision and how important that is um, really for um, uh, creating that strong financial foundation. So establish a long-term vision. We have underneath this pillar, we have two leadership strategies that we want to highlight and talk about. And the first is um, promoting collaboration. So we 
the way we describe this is that the only thing better than an inspiring vision is an inspiring shared vision that, that this really needs to bring people together. So you have to turn your stakeholders into co-creators as you define a long-term vision, that it can't just be something that the city or the county or the government makes up on its own. You really need to include people in creating that vision. The other leadership strategy that we um, include under establish a long-term vision is balancing long-term goals with short-term needs. Um, you have to seek balance in all things and we advocate for both the big picture and day-to-day -day needs. We know that people in, um, instinctively deal with short-term issues. That's what's first of mind for a lot of people is those short-term needs. But unfortunately, you know, when people think in the short term, they're often thinking more in their self-interest and it's those long-term goals that often get them to be thinking and acting more collaboratively. So there, there is a balance that we have to figure out there um, in how we uh, balance the long-term and the short-term together. Again, government um, uh, politicians uh, were often very uh, short-term minded, but we need to figure out that uh, long-term balance as well. So we do have um, some research that backs us up, and I want to talk a little bit about how we um, convince people of the benefits of cooperation. So there's um, a game out there in research called the public goods game, and in this game, each participant is asked to make a contribution of their own private resources into a common pool, similar to maybe how citizens would contribute taxes to a public budget. So as this illustrates here, the, the graphic up here illustrates that um, contributions are made. Uh, so we have the, the three participants here. Contributions are made. And so uh, we might have one person gives a dollar, another person gives two, and somebody else gives three. So you've got a total of $6 in the pool. The experimenter here in the middle um, multiplies that by two, and then each participant gets $4 back. So um, this multiplier that the experimenter applies is similar to what should happen when an individual pays taxes for public services. They're worth more to the individual than the taxes that the individual pays. Now in the experiment, the game is played over multiple rounds, and you might expect that people act purely in their own self-interest and contribute nothing to the pool while collecting their share, but over multiple rounds, this is not the case. People are willing to contribute, but not unconditionally. The experiment found that participants were less willing to contribute if they received fewer benefits. For example, if the experimenter lowered the multiplier. Research also found that when the game is played in just one round, people do adopt a more self-interested strategy because there are no long-term consequences. But when the game is played in multiple rounds, people consider the effects of their actions on other players because there will be consequences for pursuing these selfish behaviors and the cooperation breaks down. So the takeaway here for local government leaders is that stakeholders need to be convinced of the benefits that come from participating in a collective effort. It's important to note that research shows that these benefits don't necessarily need to be financial as they were in this experiment, they can also be intrinsic rewards, such as serving a higher purpose or achieving a challenging goal. So government leaders can encourage collaboration by creating an inspiring shared vision for, future, for the future and showing how the community can achieve this vision by working together. And we have an example of a place that did this, which is what I'm gonna talk about next. So that's the county of San Bernardino. So, so again, David Wirt, who's the public information officer for San Bernardino County, was not able to join us today. Um, so I'm gonna be standing in for him to discuss this, which is San Bernardino's collective vision and plan. So a little bit, first I want to give you a little bit of background on uh, San Bernardino County. Um, this is in California, obviously. Um, they, it's a very large county in terms of landmass. It is 
20,105 square miles. So that is, as, it, as we can see here, that's larger than nine states and some countries even. And I think it's twice the size of the state of Massachusetts. It's just a very, very large county. It's also a large in terms of population. It has 2.1 million people, making it the 12th most populous county in the United States. It also has a wide variety of public and private organizations that provide community health, education, water resources, all different sorts of things. And um, in and around 2009, the county was facing serious challenges that were threatening to erode its financial foundations and compromise its ability to serve the public. And some of these challenges included um, social trends. So there was low income growth, high vacancy rates, low rates of college eligibility for high school students. Uh, they were dealing with substance abuse. Um, in 2010, the board had commissioned the San Bernardino County 2010 Community Indicators Report, which highlighted these troubling trends. Uh, second area where they were having some challenges was just financially. There was, in 2009, there was an $80 million uh, budget deficit, which was about 10% of the county's discretionary general fund budget. And then compounding this was the fact that the county government was very fragmented. That led to duplication of services, and there were um, lost opportunities for economies of scale. And then finally, the third area where they were having some challenges was um, there were some ethical lapses that led to the conviction of an elected county supervisor and then some staff for violations of state law. So you can imagine that led to um, lots of issues with trust, um, a public trust in the government and that sort of thing. The county also um, was facing a bit of an identity crisis. So again, they have distinct and, and fiercely independent regions. So there's two different desert regions, two mountain regions, and then three urban suburban valley regions that all kind of think of themselves separately. There's, they dealt with some name confusion. So there's the city of San Bernardino as well as the county of San Bernardino. Sometimes the constituents got confused about who did what and who was responsible for what. There's also no local media market there. Um, so in terms of having the media to help with outreach and things like that, that wasn't really present, isn't really present. And then there were a lot of new commuting residents who didn't identify with the county, um, new to the community and um, you know, might live there but work elsewhere and, and didn't really identify with the county itself. So, and you can imagine all these things kind of make it difficult to establish a, a unifying vision um, for, for the county. But in 2010, the county board brought in a new CEO to put the county on a path towards addressing these challenges. The new CEO, Greg Devereaux, and the board believed that a new vision was necessary. They realized that the county on its own couldn't address all the challenges highlighted in the indicators report and that it needed allies to do this. The county worked with the San Bernardino Council of Governments to convene initial meetings to establish this vision. It created 25 small teams of representatives from public and private organizations to analyze the issues that were raised in the San Bernardino County Indicators Report. They held 18 community meetings throughout the county in all parts of the county, uh, 22 issue roundtables, they had an online survey, which they got um, over 3,600 responses to. Um, and again, they had the participation of 24 cities and towns throughout the county and 34 school districts. Um, the vision was adopted by the county in uh, June of 2011. Um, it was based on the work of these teams and then it was reviewed and adjusted by many people over many iterations. Um, it was not only adopted by the county board, but it was also adopted by the local council of governments, all but two of the city governments in the county, many school districts and special districts, and even some private organizations in the county. So this broad adoption really shows that it truly is a county-wide vision, 
not just the vision of the county government. It, it was a vision for the entire area. Um, here is the vision itself. So uh, it, uh, com we envision a complete county that capitalizes on the diversity of its people, its geography, and its economy to create broad range of choices for its residents and how they live, work, and play. Second uh, part here talks about the vibrant, a vibrant economy. The uh, third part talks about a sustainable system of high quality education, community health, public safety, housing, retail, recreation, arts, and culture. Um, the fourth component here talks about a model community governed by an, in an open and ethical manner where great ideas are replicated and brought to scale and all sectors work collaboratively. And then it ends with this, um, from our valleys, across our mountains, and into our deserts, we envision a county that is a destination for visitors and a home for anyone seeking a sense of community and the best has, uh, life has to offer. So you can see there's a lot of sort of aspirational language there um, and very high level um, uh, vision which was by design um, and, and because they knew that this was a very, it's a kind of high level aspirational vision, their next challenge really was how to bring people together to make this vision a reality. So they did something um, called, they created these element groups. Um, and where is that? So they, these element groups, um, they talked about having different implementation goals, so they partnered with different sectors of the community um, to support the success of every child from cradle to career, and they wanted to establish San Bernardino County as a model in the state where local government regulatory agencies and communities were very business friendly. So here's some materials that the element groups had developed, just examples of how they're making this vision much more concrete. So they had some business friendly best practices there, um, uh, guide and uh, related to habitat preservation, things like this. Again, they, this is how they um, operationalized a lot of that vision and started to make it more concrete. They also developed sort of um, messaging around um, how to get this out more to the public. So they came up with these um, vision to read, vision for safety, vision to be active, vision to succeed. You can see how these are very, uh, you know, graphics that it can appeal to people and let them know um, that these are priorities for the entire county. Another thing they did to um, again, sort of operationalize the vision. Um, one part of that was getting um, all county employees on board with this. So they redefined the county government job statement. So made it very clear that the, our job is to create a county in which those who reside and invest can prosper and achieve well-being. So this is something that um, all employees understand and um, know that they are part of, of this goal, of this vision. Um, another part of this operationalization, operationalizing the vision was integrating the vision into budgets and um, agenda items that would go before the county board. So you can see that there were um, performance measures developed for the different departments related to the vision um, and reported on through their budget. And then anytime things were going before the county board, they're um, also explaining how this particular item relates back to the countywide vision. So again, just that was just one example of how um, this how San Bernardino County, one county that was facing a lot of challenges, kind of developed this very um, aspirational uh, vision for the county 
Uh, they are still working towards this today. This plan is still in place today. The you know, planning process that started back in 2009, 2009 2010. Um, but the, the takeaway here, I think, is how broad the involvement was. And again, this was not just the county government coming up with a vision for the county government. This was a broad group of people coming up with a vision for the entire county that everyone could buy into. And again, I think the fact that um, so many different organizations, not just the county government, but lots of other governments also adopted this vision really shows how um, successful they were in reaching out and bringing uh, this broad coalition of folks together. So we have a couple questions to discuss um, or, or for you guys to think about and kind of assess how, how well your organization, um, whether or not it has a long-term vision. So our very simple question, first one is, does your organization have a long-term vision? Um, so our options are yes, we do. Our entire community was included in developing the vision. Uh, yes, but it's only really relevant to staff and elected officials. No, but we're planning to develop one within the next year. No, but we would like to develop one at some point. Maybe you don't have a solid plan in place, but you're interested in doing that. And then the final option is no, and we have no interest from elected officials or other senior leadership to develop one. So you can uh, respond to that question. Adam, can we see the, can I see the results to these polls, or, or I'm trying to see maybe, okay, um, so, oh, there we go, there's the answers here, so, um, it looks like most people who responded said that uh, that B, yes, they do have one, but it's really only relevant to staff and elected officials. So um, good to hear that folks have, have a vision. Um, maybe the challenge there for you all is figuring out how to get the broader community um, involved in supporting that vision. Okay, let's move on to our next question which is what challenges does your community face related to developing a long-term vision that all members of the community can relate to? So our options here are we have no challenges, we have a solid long-term vision. Number, the second option is we have a very diverse population and have challenges making contact with everyone. That was something that San Bernardino de uh, dealt with. Uh, third option here is no matter what we do, people don't show up to community meetings. Our next option is uh, staff capacity. St staff simply have no time to focus on developing a way to engage the public. And then we have all of the above, or maybe you have some other challenge. So you guys can go ahead and uh, respond to that question. Okay, and here it looks like we had um, kind of an even distribution across all, um, all answers. So we had a, it's very similar that people kind of had um, a little bit of everything. So which that's interesting, and I think uh, I think there are a lot of challenges and uh, to de to developing something that everyone can relate to and appreciates. Um, but interesting to see that uh, all of these. Are, some, are things that people are, are facing and dealing with. 
and I think we'll learn a little bit more in the uh, following presentations um, from Jen and Scott about maybe some, some ways to, to address these challenges. So with that, I am going to hand things over to Jen Park from What Works Cities. I'm just backing up here for a second. <laughs> Okay, and Great. then I'm going to hand control over to you. There you go. You should be able to advance the slides now, Jen. Great. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, good, after, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Katie mentioned my name is Jen, and I'm the Director of Certification and Community at What Work Cities. Um, I oversee our city assessment, the certification program, and how um, over 100 city lead, over 100 cities um, approximately 600 city leaders are um, sharing best practices with one another, but also challenges when it gets to making decisions based off of data. And so today I want to give you a national view of where cities across the country are in leveraging data to inform their own strategic planning and budgeting processes. And I'll also provide an overview of the program and dive into the data that we have around strategic goals, performance, and budgeting and provide some examples of cities using data not only to start their strategic planning and budgeting process, but continue to track progress towards them and share with their residents the progress that they're making. So, What Works Cities? Um, we are an initiative that was launched by Bloomberg Philanthropies in April 2015. And the initiative helps local governments across the country improve residents' lives by using data and evidence effectively to tackle pressing challenges. In the first three years of the initiative, we, we helped over 100 cities use data and evidence to better define problems um, and make progress in crucial areas such as health and safety, homelessness, and flight. Um, the 100 cities that we worked with are home to more than 31 million residents and have combined budgets exceeding $104 billion. Um, and what we've learned from the 100 cities that we worked with in the first three years is that using data is not easy. Um, as you can see here uh, under the slide that we call the management gap, we know that cities have the will and the um, and the commitment to use data, but sometimes lack the skills or the technical expertise within city government to strategically put that data in use in a way that they can make decisions. Um, and what cities really needed and what city leaders really needed were um, our concrete steps on how they can get where their cities want to go. And, and from this gap, we were able to design and launch What Works City Certification. Uh, certification is a national standard of excellence for data-driven, well-managed local government. The program evaluates how well cities are managed by measuring the extent to which leaders incorporate data and evidence to decision-making. It also helps all cities benchmark their progress and develop a roadmap for using data and evidence to drive effective change and deliver results for residents. Uh, cities of all shapes and sizes are doubling down on their commitment to deliver the best possible results for residents by using certification as a guide. Um, the program was launched two years ago and is open to any city in the U.S. with a population of 30,000 or more. Um, we have now 13 cities that have achieved certification. And so there are cities on this map that have a silver that uh, has achieved silver certification, and then the four cities that have achieved gold. There is yet to be a city in the U.S. to, to achieve platinum. But more importantly, nearly 200 cities have completed the assessment and uh, to have their practices benchmarked against the national standard, and all have received um, support to better understand how they can improve and the steps that they can to improve. Um, as I mentioned, certification outlines best practices for cities in 45 criteria that are grouped by eight foundational practices. Um, data governance, which looks at the active presence of an authoritative body to lead and oversee data inventory in alignment with citywide technical, privacy, and strategic objectives. This includes data sharing practices, um, along with um, how you're talking internally with other departments around your data and externally with trusted partners. 
Uh, we also look at evaluation. We're looking, uh, which looks at the use of standard research methods to gain insights into the design, implementation, or effects of a policy or program. General management, which focuses on the role of executive leadership and the efforts to sustain use practices. Open data, which is the systems that are in place to promote, uh, promote informed decision making and transparency with the community. Performance and analytics, which looks at how cities are creating a culture of accountability and solving city problems through performance management systems. Uh, this includes alignment on strategic goals and desired outcomes and a, me a mechanism for tracking progress. Repurposing, which is uh, focused on how cities are shifting funds and resources from ineffective programs and services to those that are evidence-based and residence-focused. Uh, Results-driven contracting, which is how cities are using data to leverage procurement as a tool to make progress on their highest priority goals, and stakeholder engagement, which where we look at how cities facilitate opportunities for communities to use um, both open and administrative data and support cities in solving some of their pressing challenges. Uh, think of the assessment as your data health checkup uh, for your local government. Just as like we all go for our annual checkup, participating in the assessment will allow every city to better understand where they're excelling and where there's room to grow. Um, and then all cities that complete the Network Cities Assessment become eligible for a wide range of support from Network Cities. Uh, this includes a benchmarking report of the city's current state of practice and it, where it outlines a customized task for improvement, access to educational resources, webinars, workshops to accelerate progress, um, connection to peer cities across the country with whom you can troubleshoot common challenges and share successful practices, enrollment into the What Works Cities Academy, which is a learning platform that provides both virtual and in-person training, um, a dedicated coach to help cities deepen, scale, and sustain um, the work that you all are doing that are data informed, um, specifically around impact, and opportunities for technical assistance engagement, where we pair cities with What Works Cities partners to build critical data skills and tackle challenges. Um, what Works Cities is a consortium of five partner organizations that help local governments build that capacity um, and advance towards What Works Cities certification. And so, as I mentioned, we've worked with now nearly 200 cities. And through that work and the assessment, we've been able to research um, and read through strategic plans and budgets from nearly 200 cities across the country. Uh, the initiative has also provided support to cities embarking on their strategic planning process or cities that are in the middle or at the end of it as well. Um, and there are a few things that we've been able to glean from um, the strategic plans that we've read. Uh, and we've seen key factors in developing a strong strategic plan, um, which always starts with uh, understanding the data. So better understanding the state of data within cities helps city leaders better define um, what priorities should be within their strategic plan, how to tie those priorities to the budget, and then also better understand the capacity within City Hall to not only define a strategic plan, but actually implement and track progress and share that back with their community. Um, as Katie mentioned, community and stakeholder engagement is also very crucial. Uh, it requires stakeholders in the community to provide insight into shared goals and vision for the city, um, but it shouldn't be a one-time event. Um, I know many cities do uh, resident surveys or town hall meetings in advance of pulling together strategic plans, but some of the best cities in the country are also thinking about how are they sharing progress towards their goals and priorities on a regular basis, and how are they keeping their community engaged throughout the implementation of their strategic plan as well. Uh, strong, strong performance metrics that are measurable and trackable, and then, of course, uh, what is very difficult to do, um, but important, is the alignment of strategic priorities to budget. And so, to better understand the importance of data-informed decision-making, I want to share with you now the state of data practice in cities across the country. And we strongly believe that investing cities that are cities should invest in the right policies, processes, and people, and really need to take action to implement data-driven strategies. So the analysis that I'm going to share with you is, includes information from over 100 cities across the country. 
Um, and what we've seen when it gets to um, identifying strategic goals and evaluating progress towards them is that approximately 49% of our network have strategic goals and use data to evaluate progress towards them. Um, and even though nearly half of the cities that we have in our network have strategic goals, only 27% of them um, hold performance management meetings on a quarterly basis, and only 33% of them um, share their goals regularly and progress towards achieving those goals on a regular basis. We've also seen that many cities struggle to use data to manage their contracts. Um, and so you'll see here that 9%, 7%, 3% respectively around defining strategic goals and desired outcomes in key contracts, uh, making decisions on contracts based off of contractor performance, and then what we call actively managing contract, which is moving away from compliance um, to actually working with vendors, service providers, and contractors on a monthly basis to troubleshoot and also move towards achieving that shared goal that are tied directly to citywide priorities. Um, and then finally, another challenge that cities across the country are facing is the ability to make funding decisions based on data. Um, here you'll see that uh, approximately 40% of cities use data um, to align um, its budget process to strategic priorities but only 14% of cities have identified um, programs that are not working and then shifted funds away from those programs to a better solution. And then finally, many cities are engaging residents to help, crossing, help solve crossing community challenges. Um, but as I mentioned, instead of being a one-off opportunity, very few cities are doing this on a regular basis and also helping their community kind of understand the value of what the city's doing, what the strategic priorities of the cities are, and how the city's using data to solve problems. So you'll see only 11% of the cities in our network provide opportunities for partnership and collaboration with data users. Um, and then only 11%, uh, again, 11% educate and upskill upskill partners to better utilize data um, and understand data to deepen community impact. Um, so now I want to give you an example of a city that we've been working with uh, for a while. So Miami has been um, one of the cities in the What Works Cities initiative for many years now. Um, and they were able to leverage data, process improvement, analytics, dashboards, performance management um, that, that they built to help really define the priorities and vision for their strategic plan and budget, um, and then also implement a plan to track progress towards these goals. So when Miami embarked on their strategic planning process, the, city, the city's leadership recognized the importance of setting a clear vision for the city. Um, and they created a plan that included regular public engagement, such as the mayor's town hall meeting, their annual resident survey, cafe conversation, and focused community meetings to inform and cultivate their strategic plan. Um, from their city elected officials to frontline staff, uh, city staff relentlessly co connected with residents to identify what is most important. The engagement led to the identification of their five priority areas, which is mobility, housing, safety, service, and spaces. It also helped them define um, their vision statement and their mission statement. And from these priorities, the strategic planning and performance managers worked with departments to develop detailed strategic plans that addresses the needs and wants of its residents. Using this tailored strategic plan, the city then aligned spending to address resident priorities. So as a part of the city's budget process, each department is aligned to a, prior, uh, a primary priority area and goals with very specific objectives. Um, and this underscores the importance of the relationship between kind of strategic planning, performance, and the budget. Um, and so as a part of the budgeting process in Miami, uh, there is a strategic assessment now that accompanies any new budget request. 
And then um, with now a publicly available strategic plan with their goals and mission, the city continues to have performance management meetings around their strategic priorities um, and report on kind of how they're tracking the success on a regular basis with their residents through dashboards and through their website. Um, it, they also continue to share um, insights with their residents on a regular basis. So um, they have shared their resident survey insights that are available publicly to their residents. Um, and they've also shared, again, as I mentioned, key um, progress that they've been making and also where they haven't been making progress and why. And so that. Yeah, I, what I just what I want to make sure that you all take away from this presentation is the importance of leveraging um, not only data from administrative data within City Hall, but also the data that you're collecting from residents through your town hall meetings, through resident survey, and how that really informs your strategic planning and budgeting process. But also that there's just a lot of support from other cities, from our network, um, from our What Works East partners that we can provide as well on how we can, how you all can then, when a strategic plan is set, um, uh, continue to track your own progress towards those strategic goals and communicate with your residents on a frequent basis the progress that you all have been able to make to address pressing challenges for the city, but also show the improvements um, of where and the impact of the work that you all are doing. Um, so my contact information is there. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. And then Jen, so have, yes. Um, this is Katie. We have one question um, that someone had sent in, and I was just wondering if you could uh, address really quick. It's that someone said, "Have you received any interest from special purpose districts regarding um, the what works city standard? Do you mostly work with cities, or are there any like special purpose districts like?" Um, I don't know, I'm thinking like water districts or anything like that that yeah. you guys have worked with. We haven't provided support to special districts, but the assessment is available for anyone to take. So you can be a city employee, you can um, be at a county level, um, it's available. And um, I actually encourage um, anyone who's interested in learning more about kind of their current practices to go through the assessment. Um, and then the other part, the other parts of the support that we provide that are available to, to other entities that are not U.S. cities above 30,000 in population includes that benchmarking report um, where we'll outline kind of where you're excelling, where you're not excelling, um, kind of, and share aggregate data of how you compare to others, um, along with the What Works Cities Academy, which includes courses that are available virtually um, around covering content from communications around uh, the impact of your work that are data driven to uh, foundations for open data, um, how to set up uh, your RFP to be more outcomes oriented and other things like that. Great, thank you. Sure, so I have uh, two questions as well. And the first one is, how well does your organization incorporate data into its planning and decision making? One, very well. Two, okay, but not very well. Three, not well. Or four, we don't incorporate data into our decision making at all. Give folks a few, uh, maybe a few more seconds to respond to that, and then I think Adam can. Um, Close it and we'll see the results there. Great. Oh, there we go. Well, it's great. Um, so it seems like it's relatively even and very few um, are not incorporating data in their decision making at all. Um, um, but this is actually pretty consistent to what we see in our network and cities that are submitting assessments that um, very few, about less than 10% are doing it very, very well. And then, um, you know, most cities are challenged with um, the capacity to use data and uh, the siloing of departments and where there are opportunities to share data across um, departments and agencies. 
Great. And the second question is exactly that, around what barriers stand in the way for your organization using data to a greater extent in its planning and decision making? Um, one, no barriers. We do this very well. Two, no access to reliable, accurate data. Three, lack of technical expertise to analyze data. Four, staff don't have time to spend on data collection and analysis. Five, lack of political will or interest from elected officials, and six, others. So again, we'll take a minute or so to submit your answers. And it looks like um, the most popular answer here is four, staff don't have the time to spend on data collection and analysis, um, along with uh, lack of political will or interest from elected officials. Um, this is capacity to do this work is very difficult. Um, and um, we really, Besides the importance of having the right designated people um, or teams at a kind of enterprise level to be able to lead and do this work. And so when we think about data collection and analysis and the time that's spent on it, um, honestly, the first, if you're very new to using data, um, the collecting and better understanding where data is across different departments, agencies, um, in city government is difficult. Um, but having, identifying um, an individual and or team within your office or within agencies that um, have the skill set and understand the value of it will, um, will expedite kind of the ability to then analyze and use that data for decision making. Um, this, again, is something that we see across many cities. Um, it's also a budget. It's not only staff don't have the time to spend, but there's a lot of uh, budget constraints on being able to bring in that technical expertise uh, around data collection analysis. Uh, so I encourage you all to, um, uh, to check out even our publicly available resources that gives you a better sense of like where to start when there when you are kind of uh, when there's a lack of capacity to do this work and time along with um, technical expertise within city government. Great, and I think I am now passing um, it off to Along, Tom. correct. Um, and Jen, if you see um, by your name in the um, web tool, there's kind of this, your initial, there's this dot, if you just kind of hand that, like drag that over to Scott. Oh, I see. You see, yeah. No, I don't see it. <laughs> oh, you just did it. Oh, did I? Scott now has control, yeah. Got it. Well through almost there. There we go. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, again, my name is Scott Husengay. I'm the Budget Director for Kansas City, Missouri. Today, I will uh, talk to you about Kansas City's citywide business plan. I'll try to go through the evolution and development of our plan, the, the hierarchy of our plan, how we incorporate long-term financial planning into our strategic plan, 
and we'll wrap up with uh, a little bit of how our city goes about resident engagement for both our, or for all of our citywide business plan, our strategies and our finances. A little bit about Kansas City itself. That the, uh, the city itself has a population of just under half a million people, about 2.1 million in the metropolitan area. We have a council manager form of government with a $1.7 billion budget and about 7,000 employees, including the Kansas City Police Department. Um, we are the, the proud recipients of the GFOA Award for Excellence for our resident engagement in our strategic planning process. And uh, we recently um, will be learned we'll be receiving in October the 2019 ICMA Local Government Excellence Award for our strategic planning as well. It's something we're obviously very proud of here in the city and, and hope that you all can get a little bit from what we've learned and our experiences here in Kansas City. I always start these presentations with what I call our origin story, how we got from where we were in our strategic planning and long range financial planning to where we are now. And the modern era, so to speak, started back in, in 2013 at a, a, a council retreat with, with key executive staff and um, our, our city council. I remember it was May 20th, 2013, which I remember very well because it happened to be my very first day as budget director with with the city, but the city manager at the at the retreat announced that he was going to uh, direct staff, and by staff he meant me, to combine the city's adopted goals, strategic goals, uh, and merge that with a long-term financial plan. And um, what came out of that ultimately became known as what what, what is now known as our citywide business plan that's combined. Ultimately, the citywide business plan was voted into the city charter in 2014, so it, it went very quickly from um, a, a best practice we are incorporated quickly into a required document that we have to submit and update every year along with our budget process. And in uh, 2015, we incorporated um, the public uh, stakeholders into our strategic planning for the first time. and. We've been improving every year since then. We're about to go into now year seven of our current practice. Um, so at that time, following that 2013 meeting, we went into what, what we always call our, our metaphorical, at least, laboratory here in, in the finance department, and specifically the budget office, to connect the dots. We had disparate pieces of, of both strategic planning and financial planning throughout the organization. Like um, I'm sure most of your organizations, of course, had an annual budget, uh, an annual financial report or CAFR. Um, a lot of the departments had their own strategic plans. We did have financial forecasts. And we even had uh, KC Stat. KC Stat is operated by the city's Office of Performance Management. And that's the forum in which the mayor and the city manager meet monthly with one of our adopted goal areas, the directors and program managers in a goal area to, to review key metrics and strategies associated uh, with that goal. In fact, through our KC stat and other processes, uh, just this past year, Kansas City was um, designated as a, as, or certified um, at goal by What Works City, the, pro, the program that Jen was just talking about. So at the time, we had all these pieces throughout the organization, but they weren't connected in any specific way. They were just run by different departments and divisions throughout the city. So our job, again, was to organize budget, planning, reporting, and trends analysis all into what process. And what came out of that, again, was not what we now call our citywide business plan. It has three parts to it. The first is the city strategic plan, which is something a lot of folks who have a strategic plan are probably familiar with. That's the goals, objectives, strategies, and we have even actions underneath that in our hierarchy uh, to achieve our goals. We, it contains the part two of the citywide business plan is the financial strategic plan, and that has objectives that are linked specifically to the city's adopted financial policies um, on an annual basis. And finally, the, the long-term or five-year financial plan, and this is the part that's actually adopted by the city council annually to, um, to guide the budget process. So this is uh, the city's goal framework, 
and this is the, the top row, finance and governments, neighborhoods and healthy communities, et cetera. That top row is, is what we started with in 2013. The, the city had adopted goals, but really nothing underneath it. And this goal framework is very important to the city because we use this same structure for reporting everything we do. We organize the budget in this manner. You can see how the departments roll up underneath. We use it for, as I mentioned, for reporting on our KC stat process. That's done um, monthly by goal. We even use this for public engagement. It's a very outcome-based approach to budgeting and outreach. Many of you uh, who work, especially in cities, but other, other types of local jurisdictions as well, can probably relate to how it's often difficult for uh, individuals to try and relay, I guess what in our case is 20 different departments, 300 programs, um, even internally, much less externally, in a forum of maybe an hour or two. So we find that by framing our questions, our dialogue, and even our reporting in this goal framework, it's, it's much easier to get much more participation involved. This is what we call strategic planning hierarchy. It's divided loosely into two different uh, parts. You can see that the top portion, which is the strategic plan itself, that has goals and objectives. This is where we, this is our policy level where our council essentially interacts. The, the council adopts the goals and objectives and below that the tactical plan, strategies, milestones, actions. That's where the staff works to achieve the adopted goals by the city council. We recently incorporated a, a software solution to the strategic plan so that now we can track progress, again, um, essentially on demand. Um, but certainly uh, on at least a monthly basis. And again, Casey Stat uses this as well to, to monitor our strategic plan. So not only do we have adopted goals, objectives, strategies, but we're actually tracking our progress to them, which in our case is over the life of a, of a four-year council term. Our goal is to achieve all of these strategies that we adopt, and we use this system, and we use a system called Stratex to actually uh, monitor our progress. So through all this, the city has what we call our circle of life, and all of these, all of these different steps along our way in our year-round process is administered by our, you know, by our office in the, in the Office of Management and Budget for the city. So it really, we really have the, the um, unique position of not being, you know, just a budget office, just a finance office, but we are really the the uh, facilitators for the, the entire strategic process for the city. So we don't have just a, a quote-unquote budget season. It truly is a year-round process. Again, we start at the executive level at the beginning of each fiscal year with uh, first the council and then our senior management to uh, update and adopt goals and objectives. Once that's done, we add our long-term financial plan to, the, to those adopted goals and objectives and we package all of that into our citywide business plan, which we submit to the council and to the public in the second quarter of each fiscal year. We wrap a public process into it so that the stakeholders come in to, uh, to what we call resident work sessions, and we'll talk about that a little at the end, so that they're actually commenting not just on the annual budget, but on the ongoing long-term strategies for the city as well. For us, you might imagine it's a lot easier for folks to truly influence policy when we get in on the front end. So we really encourage the public to engage with us at the beginning of the process rather than at the end of the process in the budget, which comes after the citywide business plan, um, when a lot of the decisions are already made. So we've really emphasized the front end, the strategy and the long-term finances through the citywide business plan, and we call our adopted budget, just the one-year snapshot of our five-year five plan, really trying to emphasize, again, the long-term nature of how we plan, how we do financial planning, how we make long-term strategic decisions. So I mentioned after we had a strategic plan in place, the, the city manager also wanted to incorporate the financial planning that we were already doing into the strategy because really, Strategy without finance is doomed to fail, ultimately, because there are no priorities. So it's, 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 you really won't need to have the two linked. So I'll quickly go through some of the, the reasons that 
we emphasize this long-term financial plan and how we incorporate it with our city council and how we present our long-term finances as well to emphasize why this is such a key component of our citywide business plan and why we look at it at least annually and hopefully more than annually. The first key, key indicator was, of course, a structural imbalance. And this is a chart of our, our 10-year expenditures and revenues. And you can see particularly uh, this chart starts right around the time of the Great Recession, so leading up to it in the years afterwards. So for several years, we had expenditures exceeding revenues. Obviously not a, a, an enviable or a sustainable position. At one point at the trough of the, re of the recession, Kansas City had reserve levels that fell below 2% of our operating expenditures, so a very precarious position to be in. So we wanted to emphasize that we have to keep our eyes on this, not just annually, but over the long term as well. We also had uh, what I always call our, our perennial budget busters, and this is probably familiar to many organizations, particularly, again, if you work in a, in a city, especially a metropolitan city, but, but many are, are quite similar. So public safety expenses that were continuing to consume more and more of the budget, wages and benefit growth that surpassed inflation and revenue growth, and uh, increasing debt service on an annual basis quickly look at just a few of those. Um, public safety in particular, this, this first chart is a 10-year history of essentially the city's general fund expenditures by type of expense. We've lumped, lumped this into essentially police, fire, and everything else because for better or worse, that's how we look at a lot of our budget decisions, particularly in the general funds. But as you can see on, on, on this chart here, public safety uh, even throughout the, the recession, continue to increase while all other services, not just administration, but neighborhood services, infrastructure, et cetera, continue to decline. And these are in nominal dollars. So without even adjusting for inflation, all other services de have, have been declining for quite some time. This is a similar chart except on as it relates to personnel. And you can see this chart is even more striking because Again, while public safety essentially remained flat, you can see a, a bump in fire in 2011, and that's because that's, that's when our fire department assumed the ambulance services, which had previously been a separate nonprofit. But otherwise, those services remained essentially flat while uh, all other governmental employment decreased by over a third during that time. Some departments, like, like our finance department, reduced by as much as half. So, Something in the long term, again, unsustainable. Similar trends with wages and benefits as a whole in the city. Uh, I'm sure that, again, this looks probably looks familiar to most people. Wages and benefits continue to grow as a percent of operating expenditures now consuming over 70% of the general fund operating budget. And uh, health and pension in particular have been growing. The city of Kansas City started playing the full annual required contribution for pensions beginning in 2015. But that was a $15 million increase for the city in one year. And of course, that continues to this day. Um, and that, that these costs continue to increase absent true, true pension reform. So this is one of the key drivers that we continue to look at. And finally, uh, our, our debt service for a long time has been uh, well above our, our peer average of about 10% has continued to grow gradually with some swings along the way. But again, these are just some of the key financial metrics that we look at and continue to, to monitor and analyze and report as part of our overall financial planning. Again, why we emphasize that uh, we have to incorporate long-term financial planning into our overall strategic plan. So each year, as required by charter, we prepare a five-year financial plan, and we do that with uh, essentially two scenarios. We prepare first what we call our baseline scenario. This is the all else equal scenario or the known knowns as it says here. I'm sure many of you do some version of this where you, 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 you project out for you know, probably five or more years based on the current budget, what we do now. And typically when we do that, the, the, the reserves level and everything else tends to fall off a cliff. If, if your projections look anything like ours. So we also prepare, and what's required 
is a balance scenario, which essentially fixes the baseline to at least meet the, the reserve requirements in the, that which we're trying to achieve and maintain and any other programmatic levels as dictated by the council. We look at the balance scenario as just one of really infinite alternatives. Our model is made to be flexible and can be updated anytime, reported anytime, but the council is required again by charter to adopt a balance scenario at least once per year and that's done really before the budget process begins and this is what guides our budget process. So very quickly, um, we go through and we, and we tell them what, what our assumptions are in the baseline assumptions and the baseline scenario. I won't read all of these, but we, we state what assumptions we're making for wage and benefit growth. We, um, include, of course, standard inflation, and we include any programmatic assumptions that we're making um, that, that are known that are changing from prior years. So in this particular case last year, we were anticipating new ambulance revenue due to a state program. Um, ongoing decreases in municipal fine revenue and new debt service. And these are, again, what we call the known knowns along the way. And then we provide them in the assumptions, the, the balance assumptions of some of the fixes along the way. Uh, we model and project for both our general fund and our key special revenue funds. We can be very specific in our assumptions or we can be very broad as well, which, which is Kind of what we would do in this case, we, we essentially mentioned that some of our funds need fixing and then we have to find, in this case, $44 million somewhere to fix it. We have the ability to be very specific. We have to somewhat take the council's guidance on how we want to achieve that, but at the very least, we can provide this to them. They have to adopt some version of this and uh, you know, everyone at least is on the same page as we go into to the budget season. And these scenarios also link back to our strategic plan because uh, some of the programmatic measures that we're talking about are based on our strategic plan and the, the strategies adopted therein. When we, get, when we report the financial plan in our scenarios, there are several key uh, benchmarks and we put them in dashboard form, the charts that you see before you, that we analyzed throughout, throughout the way and included in our report annually. One of the key metrics, obviously, that we look at is level of reserves, and these, this is just a very simple comparison of the baseline to the balanced scenario. Um, again, unsurprisingly, the baseline scenario shows our reserve levels, which have just recently achieved our adopted goal for the first time in our history, uh, going down over time, absent other changes. And again, the, the, ba the balanced scenario in this particular case is just trying to simply do enough to maintain at least our adopted reserves policy. We also look at what we call our portfolio of services. This is much like a personal portfolio, you know, just like an investment portfolio, and we always ask the council, how do we want this to look? Currently and projected out for at least the next five years, police and fire will make up about three quarters of the general fund. And the question is, is this how we want our portfolio to look or do we want to rebalance that in some way? It's very difficult to make sweeping broad changes within the context of a one-year budget over a five-year or longer time frame. It is possible to gradually make inroads if we want to make this portfolio look differently than it does now. We typically model capital expenditures the decline of capital expenditures and, and maintenance, particularly in recent years, has been a big concern for city. It usually ranks at the top of our resident surveys, and we model how infusions of our uh, general obligation bond debt for infrastructure will impact capital spending over the next five years. And along with that, we can model our taxpayer impact because our infrastructure infusion is supported by property taxes through, through debt. Uh, we, we model what, what the residents are paying for that in new debt because this is something that um, there, there are certain levels that we promised the voters when we went to get the authorizing authority for the debt that we would not surpass. So we're modeling, are we keeping our promises to the voters in terms both of maintenance and in terms of the taxpayer impact for that maintenance? So there are many different applications for our model. 
again, we when we when we go through this, the council is required to adopt an official balanced scenario each year. But we emphasize that there's, these are scenarios, not projections, and it's meant to be iterative, ongoing um, use of it. Hopefully, more than once a year. In fact, our planning model just came up yesterday in one of our committees when there was a, a request to potentially add 30 new police officers for the next five years. Um, as you can imagine, that was a rather expensive proposition, but what came out of that at the committee and the council will vote on it today is to essentially ensure that the police department, which is a separate entity in Kansas City, and that's a whole other story, but um, essentially um, direct the city manager to incorporate any changes to police staffing within the context of the five-year plan that we will unveil uh, in September of this year. So just the fact that um, it's been bought into by the council, um, just having the plan and having them being required to, to uh, see it and to adopt it annually just raises the awareness of both the strategy and the finances of the city. And even if our elected officials are not always intimately familiar with all the details behind it, just the awareness and, and having to look at on, a, on at least an annual and ongoing basis has really um, helped the overall strategic and financial situation for the city. And the fact this has been our, our reserve level since 2009, that recessionary period that I referenced before, you can see it was down to uh, just over 2% in 2009, uh, it was up to 17.3% in 2018 when we first hit our goal. And when we report to council next month, we think we'll be over 20% for the first time ever. Now, granted, I think a good economy probably had something to do with this growth in our reserve levels. At the same time, I also think with the absent of the, the new strategic planning and financial planning through our citywide business plan, I don't think this would have been possible. It's certainly not to this level. So finally, with uh, our strategic planning process and our financial processes in place, there was one missing component, and that was public participation. So as I mentioned at the front, starting in 2015, we incorporated what we call resident work sessions in different areas throughout the city. And at these resident work sessions, we try to mimic the budget and planning process in approximately two hours. And it's just like our circle of life. We start with the high-level strategy, and we work our way down to the, the programmatic and the operational level through different exercises. We start with focus groups, which is kind of the high-level visioning strategy exercise. We typically take participants through a prioritization exercise, and that's where they look at the strategies that the staff and the council has proposed to achieve the adopted goals for the city. And finally, at the end, we take them through the budget exercise where they're looking at programs and services and prioritizing that way. So again, just like you know, how we developed the plan internally with staff, uh, we, we start the high level um, with the strategy and then work to build the finances behind it at the end so, so they get the full context of what we're doing, hopefully, in just a couple of hours. Is a picture from just one of our resident work sessions. We've, we've done this for about five years now. But, and again, just some of the questions you see in our focus groups, um, this is at the high level. We found that people really just like being heard. And that's, that's really, um, it sounds simple, but it really is um, just incredibly valuable to just not only the, the uh, development of a plan, but, but the overall um, engagement of, of our citizenry. And it's helped our our, uh, our customer satisfaction levels as well. Our challenge is to synthesize the comments into actionable items for the strategic and financial plans. And I'd like to think we, we refine our process just a little bit each year to get better and better all the time. We cannot, or I cannot over communicate um, to everyone else you know, how participation influences the plan and the budget. The, one of the key things that I, that I think keeps people coming back to our sessions year after year, continuing to refine and redevelop our existing long-range plans, is that we try to tell them how their input really does matter into the process. So this is an example of a couple of years in the making here. Um, I believe it was 
A couple of years ago, neighborhood services frequently came up in our prioritization exercises as the top priority from those resident work sessions. So when we followed up with the budget, we, this is one of the slides we use. We, in our budget presentation, we said that based on your feedback in the fall, these are the additions we made specifically to neighborhood programs um, as a result. And similarly this year, uh, youth programming, um, essentially having more for youth to do, keeping them off the streets, that type of thing was the top priority. So we added $200,000 for that. Again, as the slide says, as a direct result of resident engagement. Uh, similarly, infrastructure investment is always the top priority in our annual resident survey and sometimes at our work sessions. So we continually communicate the impact uh, of and feedback to the plan and the budget through that as well. So um, finally, I mentioned before that um, we were the, uh, I guess, two-time now winner of the GFOA Award for Excellence. You can see our 2018 award on the GFOA website if you want to learn more about our process and particularly our, our resident engagement. And uh, our website at kcmo.gov slash budget has all of our plans and tools and our online engagement and, and, uh, pl and, and uh, transparency tools as well. So a quick summary. Strategic, uh, strategic and long-range financial plans can assess the current environment and respond to changes. Again, we emphasize that it's, that it's iterative, it's, it's ongoing. The importance of our annual cycle, um, Jen alluded to this before too, this is not a one and done process. We're continually updating, refining, and, re and reworking our plans, continually monitoring to ensure that we're achieving these strategies that are adopted by the City Council. And having these plans in place, develop the commitment, achieve consensus of goals and strategies, both at the council level and in the public, so we're all committed to the same plan. No longer do we have disparate plans throughout the organization. The, the entire focus is on the citywide business plan, and that really is a first for our organization. So, fine. so thanks again for, for joining today. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. We are. Uh, very active on social media, so if you think of any questions now or later, you can email us, tweet us, go to our website. I'm happy to interact personally. I like learning from everyone else as well. And again, thank you everyone for, for your time today. And I think we can go to our first, or I guess uh, first question for me, question five overall. And that question is, um, what type of long-term plan does your organization currently undertake? So one is organization-wide financial planning, two, organization-wide strategic planning and vision setting, three is department-specific planning, economic development, housing plan, transportation plans, et cetera, four, none of the above, or five, all of the above. So hopefully we can open the poll and we'll see your responses. Okay, so, so similar to the others, a pretty wide uh, distribution. Looks like there was a slightly coalesce between all of the above, which is great, uh, department-specific planning. And um, this is, you know, probably not too surprising. I, I find that most is probably, probably a mix of different ones. It depends a lot on the setting. Um, ours was, again, as I mentioned, a very iterative process, pretty despair at first. I mentioned right at the top that we had um, and we're, we're probably in number three. We had a lot of individual plans, like I mentioned, but um, not too much. It was done holistically. So, uh, like everyone else, we continue to to work on improving both internally and externally. And I like to think we're uh, 
still getting better at it even after all this time. For those in, uh, in number five, uh, great if you're already ahead of the curve. And one thing that, that I've taken away from this process too is, is never stop improving. Um, there are always little things to do, and that's, that's what continues to make um, not only the plan better, but just personally my job fun each year is to continue to make um, at, least, at least incremental improvements each year to help um, our operations and the organization as a whole. So thank you for answering that. We'll do, uh, I think, one more question, and that's, that's question six. Does your organization incorporate its long-term vision goals, priorities in its long-term financial planning or budget development? Uh, so number one is yes, these are tied together and we track and report our progress to the public regularly. Two, yes, we loosely tie our financial planning and budget process back to our long-term vision and goals. Three is no, we have a vision, but it does not inform our budget process. And four is we do not have a vision or any long-term planning. Oh, very interesting. This time we, I see I see um, a lot that's kind of coalesced around two, which is we loosely tie our financial planning or budget process back to our long-term goals. Um, not surprising, but but interesting and maybe gratifying, I guess, for me to, to see that I think most of us are in the same boat. I, um, for us personally, even though I you know, described our process in great detail here today, we're we're probably still. I would argue somewhere between number one and two. I'm not sure we're, we're to this day perfectly in sync. Like I said, we're getting better and better at it each year. Um, we're a little bit, we're, we're maybe a little better than loose, but we're not completely tied yet altogether. So like I said, it's, it's always a work in progress, but I'm, I am heartened to see uh, for everyone here today that most of us are doing this to, to some degree already, and some of us are probably pretty successful at it. So. Um, glad to see that, and again, everyone, thank you very much one more time, and uh, I look forward to hopefully catching up with some of you uh, later on, either at a session like this or at a GFOA event, but with that, I think I, I think I can turn it back over to Katie. Yes. Thank you so much, Scott and Jen. Um, greatly appreciate all that you have done. Um, I just kind of wanted to give... Um, a quick overview, again, the summary of kind of what we talked about today and, and how this all comes together, I think. So, you know, I talked about obviously what our first pillar of the framework is, which is that establish a long-term vision um, and why that is so important. And I think we saw in talking about San Bernardino, we really saw how that county um, created this inspiring, very aspirational vision that um, in its development included a broad coalition of stakeholders, right? We talked about all those different organizations, local governments that were involved, and really um, how bringing all those folks together, um, they really inspired people then to work together and have operationalized that. I think um, in Jen's presentation, we learned about the work that What Work Cities does, um, you know, creating that national standard for local governments to use data um, in the management of their programs, um, uh, in the, you know, management of their day-to-day -day business, um, you know, how helpful that is to have that kind of a standard. And again, how one city, um, in Jen's example, that city of Miami, how they used their data um, or used data to develop their strategic plan and then, I, you know, Jen shared with us some of the resources that are out there um, with what work cities with their assessment and, and other things that they have um, that can help you if this is something you're interested in more in doing. And then finally, um, Scott um, showed us really how um, in Kansas City, I think one of the, the most helpful things for me is how I think Kansas City has done a great job with that. Um, 
you know, we talked about how one of the leadership strategies is balancing long-term goals and short-term needs and how that can be tricky, but I think um, Kansas City, by incorporating um, and sort of bringing together the long-term financial planning, the strategic planning, the annual budget process, all together um, that really uh, they are responding to both the long term and the short term, right? If we think about our short term being more the, the annual budget process, but that in that process they're including the long term. Um, so really we've, we've uh, uh, a good framework for, for how that can work and, and come together. So again, thank you to, to Jen and Scott for sharing that information with us today. I did want to talk briefly about some next steps. If you guys want to learn more about um, strengthening your organization's financial foundations, a couple things again. We have our book coming out. We, I don't have a date yet, but we're hoping by the end of the summer the book is out. I think you can go to our website and pre-order that book today. Um, we have a spot on our website where there's more information about financial, the Financial Foundations Framework, and that is www.gfoa.org slash financial foundations. Uh, more information there. Um, and then, of course, we have another webinar, the next webinar in our series coming up on August 1st. Um, that's another Thursday, same time, 1 to 3 p.m. Central, and the topic of that, we're going to be delving more into the second pillar of the framework, which is all about building trust and open communication. So we will um, have uh, more case studies and, and folks sharing with us about that. We'll also talk a little bit about um, GFOA's new ethics code during that session because that code really is all about building trust. So if this is something you're interested, if you haven't already, I would encourage you to um, sign up and, and attend that. And then finally, I just wanted to mention again, there's um, if you have questions and this is something you're really excited about and want to continue learning about, please feel free to reach out to me um, or my colleague Shane Cavanaugh with any questions or challenges that you're facing. We're also just really interested in knowing what um, your organizations are doing to strengthen their financial foundations. So again, I uh, encourage you to reach out to us um, if, if um, you're so inclined. And then if, Adam, do we have any, um, if, if there are folks with questions, can we take questions from folks? Sure, if anyone has questions, you can go ahead and type them in the Q&A area of the management system on the right side of your screen. Great. Or Thank also you. the Thank chat you. panel will work. Okay, well, I don't see anyone um, with any pressing questions, um, but again, if, you know, I think all, all myself and Jen and Scott were, uh, would love to interact and talk with more folks in the future. If, you know, you, anything comes up in the future and you want to talk with any of us, again, please uh, encourage you to reach out to us. Again, thank you so much, Jen and Scott, for joining us today. Um, really appreciate that. And, and all the rest of you, too, for, for logging on and, and listening in. Thank you. Thanks again.